So I thought, uh, I don't know if the gentleman still in here was asking about, yeah, you, were, you were mentioning how much money we spend on political campaigns. And it does seem like it's an astronomical figure. Um, but does anybody want to venture a guess how much the average American spends on coffee a year? The average American spends over $1,000 a year on coffee. You combine that, times it by however many Americans there are, and you realize the amount we spend on coffee dwarfs how much we spend on political campaigns and deciding who are going to be the free le you know, leaders of the free world. So I understand. I, I believe me when uh, I say that uh, it is stunning how much money we spend in the wrong places in politics. Um, but I think you know if we're spending a billion billion and a half dollars to decide who's going to be spending and directing the course of trillions of dollars, then it's a good investment. So I think, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things to, to think about and, and uh, contemplate as we go through this, this presidential. So one of the things that I'm obviously very passionate about, uh, grassroots, uh, training people to be more effective in the field, uh, how to use data, and how to use technology. So, you know, one of the things that we really do with America Majority, but also Gravity, is we want to equip people, we want to empower them, we want to educate them, help them become better at what they do. So, again, we have very short time today, but one of the things that I at least want to, you know, put on your radar is at least get you thinking about how are you going to be better at what you do moving forward. How many of you are going to be working on a campaign this year, you think? And it doesn't matter at any level. Excellent. How many of you would say on a scale... Let's say on a scale of 1 to 10, how many of you feel comfortable using technology in the field right now? Let's say, uh, how many of you think you're between 1 and 5? Okay. How many 5 to 7? How many think you're, like, an expert at 10? Okay. There's a couple hands. One of the things that I think we have to do, and I'm going to say center-right, because by that I mean Republicans, conservatives, libertarians, everybody, we've got to become better at what we're doing with data and technology moving forward. We've got to make it part of our DNA. It has to be part of our culture. It should become second nature. So when I talk about data and technology, I always like to go back and give people a little reminder of what happened in 2012. Because this is really the first year uh, in politics where it was demonstrated to us what you could do on a mass scale if you were really focused on building human infrastructure and really focused on the data and the technology, what you could accomplish. Now, the Obama, came in, uh, Obama campaign in 2012, the core of the campaign was not flashy or even particularly innovative except in the willingness of senior staff to listen to numbers people rather than consultants acting on old-fashioned political intuition. What do I mean? Late October 2012, David Axelrod walks into the cave where all the data analytics guys are crunching numbers and asks them, how do you think we're going to do in this series of battleground states? And they said, well, we've crunched the numbers and we're going to win Ohio by this much. We're going to win Wisconsin by this much. They ran down the list. The next day, he went on television, and remember, he said, I'll shave my mustache if we don't win. And when the Obama campaign um, data analytics team was talking, this was January of 2013, they were like, we realized at that point there had been, been a significant shift in politics because now we had David Axelrod, an old-time consultant, coming in, talking to us about data analytics, listening to our numbers, and then going out on national TV and basically risking and staking his reputation on what we told him. So, Again, one of the things that really shifted in the Obama campaign was not, they weren't basing it on intuition, they were basing on data, metrics, and what the data told them, and then running on that data. So at the center of this, at the center of the Obama campaign, it was people, it was data, and it was message. And despite being evenly matched financially, Obama for America conceived of and built an operation four times the size of its competition. To give perspective, in Ohio, uh, after the 2008 election, the Obama campaign kept open nearly two dozen offices throughout the entire span between 2008 and 2012. When 2012 came around, they opened up roughly 130 offices and put more than 600 paid field staff in Ohio alone. But that didn't happen overnight. I tell people, to be fair, Obama had four years leading up to 2012. Romney had less than, let's call it six, seven months, less than a year. Uh, but Obama and his team were focused on doing the right things, plus, in addition to that, they had the time. Romney was not focused on the right things and did not have the luxury of time. So to give that a little bit of a perspective, but again, Obama built something that was four times the size of his competition. Not only was it four times bigger, it was much better at what it did pound for pound. So what makes this possible? Under the, the, the people, the data, and the message? 
and how can you do it successfully on that larger scale? Understanding your audience and knowing how to personalize your product. One of the ways that I've described this and being able to do this on a mass scale is again, Henry Ford's uh, uh, his, his construction line taking the building of a Model T from 12 hours to two and a half hours. Basically the same product, but doing it on a mass scale. And that's what Obama and his team accomplished in 2012. They were able to, on a mass scale, understand their audiences better by using data and getting a better message out that was delivered in the right way to that audience. So they personalized their product to their audience on a mass scale because they put the time and the money and the resources into building human infrastructure, really emphasizing the data, and building out the technology. <clears throat> Victory was not an accident. I thought Jeremy Bird said something very interesting. He was the head of the field operations for Obama. He said the best antidote for apathy is organizing. And they realized coming into the 2012 elections, they did not have the hope and change. They did not have the rock star uh, approach that they'd had in 2008. They knew they were going to have to get down and organize and really focus. They essentially took a national election, compressed it into 10 states, and then went precinct by precinct, ward by ward, breaking down the data, identifying people, connecting with them, understanding the best message for that demographic, and then just pushing and pushing to get those people out to come out and vote for Obama. And if you look at it, they didn't have the hope and change. There was not the excitement that there had been. If you look at the states that really decided the 2012 election, it was about four states. Um, when, you, when you add up the states that really made the difference, and they'd gone in and they'd focused in the right places, and really, truly, in many ways, stunned a lot of people and won the, the, the election when, when people thought Romney had a very legitimate chance to win. Future national campaigns are going to have to grapple with how they build this massive an organization. They're going to have to grapple with it. I think the thing that we have to do on the center right is we actually have to emphasize it. We are not emphasizing it like we should. One of the things that, that I tell people as Republicans, center right people, we look at, we look at elections and we say, it's six months out, we should start thinking about getting serious about this, where the left is doing this year in, year out, constantly building and building, building their infrastructure, building their data. Um, it's something where we have, to have a, we have to have, I hate the word paradigm, but we have to have a paradigm shift and realize this is not a you know, six month thing, this is a year in, year out, 24 seven process that we've got to get serious about if we're going to be successful moving forward and be doing it at all levels. One of the things that we you know, really emphasize with American majority is state and local. I truly believe that the national generational change that we hope for, that we want to see, doesn't start at the top, doesn't start in DC, it starts at the bottom. And the reason I, I believe that is, student of history, you look at the progressive movement and what they did, they started as a state and local movement, rose from the bottom to the top, and they fundamentally changed our government, and in so doing, fundamentally changed our society. So we've got to start thinking about how we can do this at all levels and do it constantly, not every now and then. Grassroots dominance, the emphasis on the human infrastructure, the emphasis on data and technology. On election day, Obama had 300,000 volunteers versus Romney's 34,000. It was about a 10 to 1 advantage. Obama volunteers knocked on 7 million doors and made 11 million live phone calls for a total of 18 million live contacts on election day, 2012. All of these contacts were pre-targeted as strong potential votes for Obama of people that had not yet gone out and voted. So they had put all this time and resource and on that final day, went out and knocked on or called 18 million live contacts, uh, did 18 million live contacts of targeted people that they thought should be turning out for Obama. The key difference between what Romney did and what Obama did, the, the Obama people decided that an early investment into database technology while also establishing offices and hiring staff in the key states, and then they linked them together for maximal impact. With, our, with, with what we do with Gravity, I tell people, and, and, and I want people to understand this, again, is in the last four years, we've been talking about technology, about how we can become better at it. You can create the world's best technology and without the fuel to power it, it's like putting a Lamborghini in your driveway that has no gas. And the fuel for technology is human people. It's human infrastructure. And people still want to talk technology. I tell people this, technology is a means to an end. It is not the end in and of itself. We have to start thinking about being better at data and technology. We've got to start being better about being in the field constantly building human infrastructure, building out our networks, training, constantly getting people to be engaged and be involved if we're going to have success moving forward. The source of power, the fuel, is people. 
the force multiplier is technology. Again, that whole Henry Ford example where he took the same process from 12 hours to two and a half hours turning out the same product. That's what technology does. It makes you that much better and more efficient. We, you know, four to five hundred percent more efficient in the field if you're using technology as it should be used to be talking to the right people, collecting data in real time, to be then using that data in an effective way moving forward to message to the right people and expand your audience. So the source of power is people. We should never forget that. Technology is not the end. It's a, it, it is a means to an end. And the force multiplier is, of course, technology. An army of volunteers making live targeted contacts, again, didn't happen overnight. Think about Ohio. They had four years where they were constantly in the field, nearly two dozen offices, building out contacts, training people, building out doing voter registration. This was something that they spent four years building. Culmination of four years of investing into intense strategic grassroots infrastructure and technology to make their efforts worthwhile. Again, fairly close election, but they did all the right things and they were able to pull it out in the end. Actionable data. This is one of the things, <clears throat> and the reason I changed the topic of the title, if you didn't notice, if you looked at the schedule and thought, well, he was gonna say running a campaign from a smartphone. The thing that we've gotta realize <clears throat> as center right, if you're going door to door and using your smartphone to go door to door, it doesn't mean that you're actually being as effective as possible and that you've come into the 21st century in regards to using technology in your campaigning, okay? We've gotta think of it a much more holistic approach to it. So <clears throat> one of the things that, that, that bugs me a little bit and we're trying to really educate and start to enact better practices with those that are using Gravity is say, okay, if you're gonna go door to door and have a conversation, a live conversation with a voter, and collect information on the data that's important to them, the issues that's important to them, what are you gonna do with that data that you've collected? And a lot of people are going and collecting data on the doorsteps and then not using the data like they should be going forward. For example, I go knock on a door, I talk to, let's say, I don't know, a woman in the 30 to 35 uh, years old range, ask her what the most important issues are to her and to her family, she comes back and she tells me, uh, education, um, let's just say education and Second Amendment. Those are two of the most important issues to me in this election. I go back after I've punched in all that, people are crunching the numbers, they realize the voter at this address, she has said education and gun rights are her most important issues. We have to start messaging back to her on those issues and at the same time starting to look and say how many other people do we know in that same demographic, women ages 30 to 35 that have said these are the most important issues, go find them and have those conversations and see if we can't take that model and expand the universe that we're having conversations with. We need to be more sophisticated in how we use our data, not just simply collecting it, not just simply asking, well, are you gonna vote yes or no? Do you want a yard sign yes or no? But asking what are your most important issues and then having that conversation expand the audience and the, uh, that you're having the conversation with. Now, using dynamic models, the Obama campaign ran 66,000 simulations a night and the pro, uh, to project who was winning each battleground state, their simulations were accurate to within two tenths of a point in key states. The key data source was live contact with voters every day. They were doing just an amazing quantity of door knocks, live calls, robocalls. But they said, you know, sometimes our response rates on any given night was sometimes only seven to 10 percent, but they were doing it on such a mass scale, it still gave them enough data to run uh, very accurate uh, simulations. So the thing, too, that we've got to start thinking about is, you know, we're talking doors, we're talking phones, we're talking in the field work. But we've got to think about this on a much more holistic of how we're going to take every piece of data that we should be thinking about that's coming in either to your campaign or to your organization and saying, how are we utilizing that and bringing that in to bring in this fire hose of data into the same database, attaching it to voter profiles, and then how we're using that data moving forward. So the Obama campaign, of course, their fundraising, their email. Uh, Austin was talking about how you know, email is really going to be gold moving forward. The Obama campaign, if you came to a rally, of course, it was your name and email address to get into the rally. One of the things that, that we're trying to do with, with uh, not only Gravity clients but train on is, if you're gonna use Eventbrite for your events, obviously name, email, all that stuff, do one or two quick questions on your survey to get more data as you're doing it. So start thinking about this and not just saying, hey, we're gonna use Eventbrite to get registrations for our event. We're gonna use Eventbrite to collect registrations and also various data tags on individual voters. So fundraising, email, their website and social media, targeted digital, they were able to identify and say, okay, these people online, 
This is their favorite TV show. These are their best interests on Facebook. We're now going to find how we can model out these people that have all these same interests, the issue that resonates with them, and deliver the right message. Fundraising. I mean, one out of every 75 people in the United States gave to the Obama campaign, raised almost $700 million online. The average size of the gift was $156. This is something, again, that they committed to, but it was something they were constantly refining, but they were taking all this data in. You can't have a successful online fundraising effort unless you are doing what? what what's one thing that you've got to have if you're going to be successful raising money online? Advertising. Advertising. Still missing. I just talked about emails. That's why they, they were disciplined. They were going and collecting the right data, but unless you've got, as Austin was saying, an organic effort to collect emails constantly, putting them in and then using them successfully, you can't raise that kind of money. So they were disciplined, they collected names and emails, and then they successfully used them to raise money. Email. It was targeted, it was tested. Uh, Chris Littleton was telling me it's like, you know, the Obama campaign got down to the point where they were testing emails based on age and then time of day. And they realized for a younger demographic, they could send them emails on the weekend at 1 a.m. and get a nice burst of online fundraising. It was basically drunk donations. <laughs> but he's like, you know, they realized that, hey, if we send it to a certain demographic at a certain time, they're probably going to be out drinking with their friends. And what, what's another five bucks if they're buying drinks for their friends? So this is one thing that they were constantly testing, refining, they were targeting, they tested, they were consistent. All these things, they were constantly doing these things to build out their emails and then using it to successfully fundraise. Their website, they kept on being, how do we get in as much data as possible? How do we actually make the process of giving money online even easier? So we send this email at 1 a.m. In the email, we have to make sure that it's a very short process, one click to get to the donation page, to raise money. Again, it's this whole holistic approach to collecting data, using the data to be targeted in how you're messaging, to raise money, and then also advance the message. Integration. This is one of the things as we're moving forward down the path into, into the future of politics. How do you integrate everything so that all the various streams of data that you have coming into a campaign are not coming into different silos, four or five different silos, but all into the same database? And so you've got to really think about how you integrate everything. Narwhal for the Obama campaign was a synchronized data, synchronized data from multiple sources to build out complete profiles of the supporters. Dashboard enabled supporters to connect with supporters near them and take action from home. The call tool allowed supporters in non-battleground states to use their home phones to call voters in battleground states. Stork, one of the tools they built, transferred data from vendors to databases for querying. They actually built, I can't remember how many dozens of tools that uh, Harper Reed and his team built that they didn't use. I want to say it was dozens and dozens that they used, they were experimenting with to try and figure out, again, how they integrated every, every piece of data coming into the same database and appending in relatively real time to a voter's profile so that it could have a better understanding of who the voters were. And then again, using the data to have a better message, to have better conversations with these, with these voters. So the source of power in understanding uh, who, the, who the people are to target, how you have a better conversation with them, the data. Understanding the data as it's coming in and then being much more sophisticated in how you use it, asking the right questions, understanding where people are in a given election on issues. It's interesting to talk to PhDs who, are, who, who look at these things and study these things. I asked one of them, she's at Duke. So, you know, what's, what, tell me more about how, you know, people get leveraged to vote. She's like, usually, typically, people have a short list of their important issues. You know, for example, let's say for one person it's, uh, they, they're a small business owner who believes uh, strongly in national defense, who's pro-life, who wants to see educational reform. She's like, there is one of those issues, though, that in any given election is going to leverage that voter to come out and vote for a given candidate. So it's up to you to figure out what that one leverage issue is in that given election so that you can leverage that voter to come out and vote. In one election, it might be national defense that takes that small business owner and gets them out to vote for a candidate. In the next election, however, it might be the life issue. But you have to have the conversations. You have to understand who they are. You have to take that data and say, in this given election, we've identified this person on this issue, and now we're going to get them out to vote on our behalf. The force multiplier, of course, taking that data, pushing it back out into the field, getting people to do 7 million door knocks and 11 million phone calls to understand who these people are and then get them out to vote. Millions of ongoing live voter contacts provided the data for the analysis. They cultivate an audience of millions uh, with interactions through the website, through the email, through social media. 
the campaign provided itself the opportunity to gather even more data and to continue to grow its audience. What do I mean by that? People are key to gathering the richest, most current data. We can have this conversation at some point about what we think about voter modeling. I think some people have been more successful than others. I don't think anybody can say with any certainty that they have perfected the model of modeling out voters. Chris and I have this conversation all the time, Chris Littleton. The best way to understand where people are at in a given election is to have a conversation with them, either on their doorstep or on, on, a, on a phone call. Of course, if you're going to do that on a mass scale, you have to have invested time into building out human infrastructure to have the people to have those conversations, and we simply haven't done that, and we haven't done it in a long enough sustained way to be successful. We've got to start thinking about doing that. But people are going to be the best, are the key to gathering the richest and best data in the immediate. Data is the key to finding out, finding the audience by learning their needs and preferences, and then you expand the target audience and it provides the opportunity to gather more data, raise money, and further expand the audience. What I mean by expanding your audience is this, understanding what a certain demographic is. Let's say you're talking in western Colorado to a single Hispanic woman on the issues and you've identified after talking with a couple hundred single Hispanic women and there's two or three issues that are consistent across the board with them, you now understand that probably with single Hispanic women living in western Colorado, the odds are that these one or two issues are going to be the issues to talk to them about moving forward. Now that you've understood this, you can now expand it and say, we're going to try and go have conversation with 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 single Hispanic women on these two issues, test our theory, and then understand, you know, again, this, this theory holds or maybe it doesn't hold. But expand your audience by understanding this, the small group that you've had conversations with and then build out from there and see if you can't expand the audience you're having a conversation with. So the key to everything that Obama did was people, data, and message. And that's the key for us moving forward. So one of the things that I tell people is, again, what makes this possible? Understand your audience and know how to personalize your product. Can anyone do this? And this is the message that I have for us. Of course, anybody can do this. The answer is yes. Now in 2016, what was not possible for a lot of people in 2012 because of the advances that have been made with technology, uh, with databases, with storing things on the cloud, Everybody from school board, from local level races all the way up to national races, has the ability to leverage data and technology in an extremely sophisticated way. So that's incumbent upon us, those on the center right, to become better at data and technology moving forward at all levels. We have to become more sophisticated in our approach. And that's the, you know, that'd be my one challenge to you as we're in 2016. How can you guys go home and actually apply some of this stuff and become better at what you're doing? Um, I, I, we, we love to do these events. Uh, we love to talk with people and exchange ideas and educate, but one of the things that, again, is pointless if we're having a good conversation about ideas and strategies and all these tactics, if you don't go home and actually do something with them. So again, that's my challenge is let's say, you know, you've learned something that you think is extremely valuable, go home and put it into action. I'm going to use some of the examples of things we've learned from the Obama campaign that we have applied to gravity and actually we think gone beyond some of the stuff they did in 2012. So again, when you guys are going door to door, this is inside our portal where you can go and pull and, and query all voters inside a precinct. When you guys are going door to door, are you having conversations with every voter or a certain targeted list of voters? Exactly. We need to be targeted in the conversations that we're having and who we're having these conversations with. In this given precinct, there's 841 voters and 364 households. But let's say we're involved in a Republican primary. We, of course, don't want to talk to everybody. We want to talk to high-intensity Republicans, so we filter down. We talk to, we've drilled down to 53 voters and 42 households. We're not having targeted conversations with those people that we think are most likely to go out and vote in this next primary. We want to be much more efficient with our time, and now we have the tools that give us the ability to do that. We build our walk list. Our walk list, then we can optimize so we're more efficient in how we're going in the process of knocking on doors. And then with the mobile app, we've built, a, we've built a survey that's in the mobile app, so now we can have conversations with these people and be collecting data in real time that's appending to their profile inside the database in real time. We start the survey, we ask them what are the most important issues to you? And they'll say education, jobs, taxes, great, next question. We actually, in a primary, want to know who they're voting for in the Republican primary. Um, 
the Black Widow, Captain America, Hulk, Iron Man, Thor. You have the ability now to go beyond just asking a simple question of who are you voting for. You can ask, <clears throat> I'm voting for Captain America. Why are you voting for Captain America? And the next question would be, I'm voting for Captain America because of these issues. Trying to get a better understanding of why they're voting for a certain person. Again, understanding the issues, understanding why they're voting, understanding why they think they're voting for somebody, and then trying to link those together to message, uh, better message moving forward. Again, always taking the opportunity to collect email, make other notes, and then you move on. Once you've moved on, a little check mark comes up, you've knocked on that door, you've had a conversation, you keep going. So then afterwards, you've now collected these data tags, you can even pull them up on the mobile app and say, hey, we now know uh, that this person's been there, uh, their most important issues are economy, spending, um, we have other data tags on them as well. So it gives you the ability to not only collect data in real time, but you can even, before you go up to the doorstep, quickly cl uh, click on a button and say, hey, we know who this person is, we have a better idea who this person is, before we have a conversation with them. Phone system, same way. Again, integrating everything so there's not different silos, but saying we have doors, phones, CRM, donations, uh, email, all of these various things, all of them coming into the same database in real time so we can have the data in the same place, look at the data, watch it come in in real time, and then make better decisions both strategically and financially moving forward. Again, that's the one thing that, that is, when we were talking earlier about campaign spending and all the money that we're spending, we're not, we're not using the data we're not emphasizing the data enough to make better decisions moving forward on how we're spending money and where we're spending money. And that's one of the things that we've got to become better at moving forward. Uh, you can do this doing, uh, using our texting feature. My staff thought they'd be funny and throwing in uh, Representative Ned Ryan, thanks you for your support, ship in 10 bucks today. Uh, to be entered to win a dinner with Ned and Kate Upton. Again, texting, same thing, coming in, sending it out, comes back in. You start to build out profiles on people, understanding where they are, Understand that uh, you know Chris Littleton is uh, economy and healthcare voter, and uh, understanding uh, all the, ever, uh, uh, the different details about him as well. So we built, we continue to build out his profile from election to election to election, and understand where he is on the issues. But that doesn't mean that we actually know where Chris is in a given election. We need to reach out to him in a given election to have a conversation to understand what that one leverage issue is that's going to get him out to vote. Some of the stuff that we've done, and, and again, it's, it's understanding the power that is at your fingertips right now as a grassroots activist, as a school board, or a city council, or a county commission candidate, somebody running at a very local level. There are so many tools that have been built that up to a certain level are free, that we've integrated, that are now all inside the same suite of, of tools, that you, all you have to do is they're already integrated for you. You have to know how to use them and be successful in using them um, we, we've built these things for you though, but SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey, you can now do online surveys, whether it's on social media, whether it's through email, whether it's through a text uh, campaign, you now have the ability to go out and send out surveys, ask people, what are you thinking about this issue, and get immediate response. One of the fun things that we do with our Touchstone surveys is we'll just dial out 85,000 calls. We did this a lot this last year, ask who you, who you gonna vote for for president, we were doing it on such a, a massive scale, we'd dial out 85,000 numbers, and we would get anywhere from eight to 10% response. But if you're dialing out 85,000 dials, you're getting back 8,500 responses on a very specific demographic that as we filtered through the call list that we wanted to call, we'd be calling four out of four Republican primary voters. And then we would understand 8,500 of them felt this way about the given candidates. It was really a fascinating thing, and it all come back within a span of about two hours. We dial out. They push the button, they come back, and we knew, we call them flash polls. We would know in a span of a relatively short amount of time where four out of four primary voters were in a given state. So you've also got Eventbrite. One of the things that we, we're encouraging people, and I just went to a, a Marco Rubio rally Sunday in Percival, which is about an hour from here. It's where I live, it was a mile from my house. I went out of curiosity. They used Eventbrite pretty well. They obviously did it for registration, collect your email. They asked two really quick questions that were important to them. Are you gonna vote for Marco? Are you interested in volunteering for Marco? Yes, no, yes, no, you hit submit, and now they've got your name, email, whether you're voting or not for Marco, and whether you're interested in volunteering. And of course, that was Sunday, the primary uh, was, was last night. I will say this, I, I'm an outside observer right now, I was a big Carly fan, was helping her super PAC right now, currently in this, I'm just a very curious observer from the outside. Another week, Marco probably would've won Virginia. They were doing the right things, 
uh, in a lot of different ways. Give him a couple more days, he probably would have won. He lost by three points last night. But using Eventbrite, again, what we've done is integrated. You're collecting all this data. Once they hit submit, it's appending to their profile inside the database. MailChimp, you know, up to a certain point, I think it's at 2,000, 2,500 emails. It's free. Using MailChimp, we've integrated, so as you're sending out surveys, you're doing whatever you are through MailChimp, again, the answers, the responses are coming back into your database. There's no reason for us not to have all these integrations in place because of the tools that are available, the work that's been done. Now these tools are at your fingertips. The question is, what are you going to be doing to become better at them? The wave of the future is data and technology, making better decisions moving forward. How are you going to become better at doing it? So, as I wrap up, the five things that we must get right moving forward are this. We have to be metric driven. And by metric driven, Steve Sutton was talking about vote goals. We have to sit down and start thinking about what are the metrics that we think we need to achieve to be successful. We have to have the goals in place. We must be data driven. We should not be making gut decisions. We should not be basing it off intuition. We should be looking at the data. We should be looking at the data and saying, what is the data telling us? Are we doing the right things to be getting in the right kind of data, the, the most current data, the richest data? Of course, are we putting time and effort into getting people trained to be out there in the field doing the right things? We have to be data driven. We have to make data and technology and organizing a part of the rights DNA. It's still not there. Of course, I think it comes much more naturally to the left and some of their political philosophy, how they live their lives, their worldview. It's a little different than us. We, of course, would like in many ways for this to leave us alone so we can focus on our families, on our jobs, every, every, everything else we'd love to focus on. But we have to make this a part of who we are, and we have to become better at it. If, I'm convinced that each one of us will go home and at some level, I'm not asking you to become, Aubrey hates this term, but an online ninja, a technology ninja. I'm not asking you to become that. I'm asking you to go home and at least become comfortable with this, become aware of this, so that when you come to the next campaign, you're encouraging them to either use this approach or when you step into that campaign day one, you are a far more effective volunteer or of much more value to that actual campaign. So we've got to get better at what we're doing. Data should inform, again, our strategic and financial decisions. We could think that you know, if, we're, if we're looking at data and doing all the right things collecting data, we should be able to tell, get the story out of it. Are we having the right message to the right people moving forward? And if not, we need to change our message. Are we spending the money in the right places? And if we're not spending the money in the right places on the right message, we should shift our message and shift how we're spending our money. And the thing with this, anyone at any level can do this now. This wasn't, this wasn't possible a few years ago. This was not possible to be able to use powerful technology like this. Now it is. Now you can do this. The question is, are you going to do this? Are you going to go home and have conversations with people running for school board or city council, county commission, state, house, state, senate, congressional, and say, hey, are we, doing the, are we having the right approach in how we're approaching campaigning? Politics is policy. I'm going to go on my little soapbox now and use some American Majority uh, when I talk at American Majority trainings. I'm a big believer that politics is policy. What do I mean by that? Those who win politically, they get to implement policy. We have focused too much in the right, I think, on our ideas. We love our ideas. We think they're the greatest, and they really truly are the greatest. But we haven't focused enough on winning. We haven't focused enough on the strategy, the tactics, the organizing, the data, the technology to put ourselves in place to win so that we can actually implement the right policy that we know will put this country on the right track. And not just at the national level. Again, going back to what I said earlier, national generational change doesn't begin at the top. If you want long-term sustained generational change that changes how we approach government, that changes the, the role of government in our lives, shrinks government, devolves government, it's not going to begin at the top. It's going to begin at the bottom. And it begins at the bottom. It builds up. It builds up to such a, such a point that I think it will hopefully overwhelm that, the, those at, at, at the top and compel them to devolve power back. Back to the states, back to the people, all of these things. But we can't do any of this. We cannot be successful in any of this unless we're actually doing the small things well. Again, we achieve great things by doing the small things well. And that would be my challenge to you going home. Go back, get comfortable with this, at least be aware of this, start practicing this, become better at what you're doing. And again, if we do this enough, the local level, the state level rises from the bottom. Great change happens. So I'm done. I'm not sure how much time I've got left. I've got a few minutes. Seven minutes. Questions? 
Um, if we're talking about using that in the right way from an actual available design, uh, during the 2012 election, one of the effective measures of the Obama campaign was the slander that Mitt Romney was an out of touch, uncaring rich person who didn't care that he caused cancer in his employee wives. Is there a data driven solution to that problem in the available and by data meaning, okay, if they're using that message, what is our response back to them and understanding, you know, they're saying he's causing cancer, but our message back to them based off the data, yeah, I mean, you're going out and survey, let's say you go out and survey people and say, is this message resonating? And you can see, uh, you know, it is. And then you're gonna have to kind of A-B test what is the right message back and trying to feel out where people are at on that given issue and say, you know, this issue is hurting us. After talking, you know, maybe robo surveys with 20,000 people on what, what do you think is, is, I don't know, whatever it is. Getting that data back and saying, okay, this message we think is the best answer in response back to that attack. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's ways to do it, and there's ways to do it in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so, yeah. On the, uh, on the mobile app, uh, <coughs> you, you can ask a series of questions. And is there a section for notes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, one of the things too is we wanted to give people the ability if they saw you know, walking up to the door, this person had an NRA sticker on their car or a Marine Corps sticker or, you know, whatever it was, they can make a quick note and then that attaches not as a data tag but goes into the notes section under the voter's profile inside the database. Yes. Yeah. So I agree with you with Obama did in 2012. So explain to me so I think Donald is a extremely, extremely unique character that, no, and I, by that, you know, whatever you want to take with it, but who can get away with some of this because he's so good at getting earned media as some of the other things that he is able to do that others are not. Donald Trump is unique to the point that nobody else can be successful. I don't think anybody else could be successful doing what he's doing without doing some of the fundamentals. So, I mean, it's, it's Donald Trump. I mean, I know that sounds like kind of a shallow answer, but I'm like, I don't think anybody, he's very, let's, what, however you feel about Donald Trump, Donald Trump is a very good showman. Donald Trump is <clears throat> got extremely good instincts, actually. Um, I think he's kind of out politician to politicians who've been doing this for decades. So he's got these good instincts, he knows how to get earned media. Um, you know, it's kind of been unusual, to, but they've been able to pull together these massive rallies, 30,000 people at a time. Um, he's, he's doing things because of who he is, but I don't think anybody else, clearly nobody else can pull off some of that stuff. Maybe. Maybe. But how many of those people are actually running for office? I mean, it's, it's like, a, you know, 99.9% .9 of those running for office would never be able to do what Donald Trump is doing and be successful. So... Maybe I'll qualify this by saying 99.99% .99 of people have to do this unless you're Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump, you can literally get away with saying anything and doing whatever he wants and be successful. But I will say this though, as a you know, addendum to that, I think what Donald Trump is doing now, he can get away with in the primary. I don't think what he's doing now will be successful in the general. Because let's face it, the media has been relatively kind, I put that in quotes, kind to him. Um, he's been able to generate a lot of our media, he's been able to do a lot of things. That all changes when he, if he is, the nominee. I agree with you, but I also said he can't be Well, yeah, I know, people are like, well, we said that, I'm like, I, I know, I just, the fundamentals, he's gonna, have, and he's starting to. You can see some of the stuff that's taking place in the field, some of the stuff they were doing in Texas of trying to go door to door, they're trying to put more emphasis on it. I think they're realizing that what's going on now is not, would not be successful if he's the nominee in the general. And I would probably agree with that again. It's Donald Trump, so I guess all bets are off, you know? Yeah, I think it's more of a media sensation that having his programs that he did and so far these people. Hasn't heard him. I mean, the name ID that he had is incredible. Yes. How does that kind of integrate the Yep. I mean, so one of the the question was, how do you get uh, a, a campaign the, of an older candidate with maybe an older demographic doing a lot of the volunteer work? 
one of the things we've realized with a younger generation, an hour of training on this, good to go. Um, it's a more consistent approach to saying, okay, trust me, this really is all about pushing a button. And you just push the right button when you get to that point and push that button. It's just pushing the right button and it's getting them comfortable. And again, that's why I challenge you guys, go home and start doing this in the field, getting comfortable with it. We have found with an old dem demographic, it usually takes a little bit longer to get them comfortable. And then a couple times in the field, they realize, oh, Great, I just had to push that button. Yeah, that's what we told you, but that's all you have to do is just push the right button, and then when it says go to this address, you go to that address and click on that button, and it brings up. It's getting them comfortable with it, and, and that's a process of training and training and training some more. That's what the Obama campaign did, is they're building all this technology. They were refining, they were testing, they were building new technology. They said we were doing so much training constantly online, in person, it just became something they were doing all the time. And so that'd be my, I guess my response back is getting just Training, 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 getting people comfortable, 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 get them into the field and real world experience a couple times. And then at that point, we found most of these people are like, okay, I got it. I got it. What do we got? Two minutes? About two minutes? All right, we'll do two more questions. Yeah, about three minutes. Analytics into data. Yeah. Right, shouldn't really support you. Right. Uh, no matter coming what it is. Uh, talk about what the source of the source of the source of the I mean, listen, there are people that are doing a much better job moving, you know, in, in the last couple of years. Um, there, there, there are people that are really trying to focus on this. You know, I always try to be objective. The RNC Data Trust, they're doing a much better job than they were even a year ago. They, they even think they're about 75% ahead of where they were a year ago. Um, uh, you know, L2's got some good data. There's, there's ways to kind of get to a certain point, but I always tell people the most important thing is getting a very good base file, and by that I mean a base file with people's names, addresses, vote history, all that, rooftop geocodes. Demographic data to me is one of those things, if you can get some, you'll spend a lot of money on it. If you go up, get at least a few different points, and then go start having conversations in a targeted fashion on people's doorsteps on their phones. Last question. So this is awesome, and you can collect a ton of data from a ton of different data. Right. But in your Um, well, of course, I always say uh, people's voting history is massive indicator. Are they going to vote in the next election? And so, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to say what presidential campaign it was or who was doing the analytics, but when they sent a list of uh, 10,000 targeted voters uh, for the Nevada caucuses with only 2,000 of those 10 that had ever voted before in a caucus, I was highly skeptical. If 80% of that list that they sent, they had modeled out of people that had never before voted in a caucus, I just, I have a hard time believing that. So vote history is a huge indicator. Um, what was the other one they were looking at? Obviously home ownership and length of home ownership. I mean, you start breaking it down, there's, there's usually about four or five indicators that give you an indication. They're gonna vote, likely what uh, primary they're gonna vote in. I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple different, well, home ownership being one of them, length of time in the house vote history, all those things. So, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I typically tell people, you can go crazy and sometimes people want to, you know, we have 2,500 data points on a given voter. Awesome. You really need about, I think in my mind, my estimation, 510, to really, if you're gonna be doing this and putting the emphasis on collecting and understanding and putting, like, let's not go crazy. All right, that, last question. Comment, yeah. um, to the, first, the gentleman that made the first question about how you counter, you know, the bad stuff. Uh, you should look up Leesburg Grid. Yes. L e e s b u r g g r i d. The Leesburg Grid is very, very great information. It's a strategy for how to look at what your weak points might be and what your opponent might take against you, and how to have your answers and how to look for what their weak points are. It was a little bit of what Jesse was talking about in the first presentation in here earlier today of who you are, who your opponent is, what you say, what they say, and so. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I'll be around, I'll be in the back, thank you.